uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Bo Bosnaki. Good and, afternoon. Uh, and our team here, Thmai Thmai uh, Online News and Cambodia, Cambodian Nation in English uh, Online News, uh, we are very, very glad uh, to see you in Siem Reap. And I have known that uh, you have uh, worked very hard uh, for the meeting yesterday or maybe um, uh, previous uh, meeting in Siem Reap and also for Uncle Archaeological Site and maybe you have worked for 30 years already? A, a bit more than 30 years. Can I say that, first of all, I am glad to be in Siem Reap. I am also honored to work with my colleagues and friends uh, from Cambodia since 19 1991. 1991, there was the agreements, Paris agreements, and at UNESCO at that time, I was the director of the Division of Cultural Heritage at UNESCO. At UNESCO? At UNESCO. In, in Paris? In Paris. And uh, we received at UNESCO His Majesty uh, Prince Sianouk with his wife, uh, Her Majesty Monica, and uh, Prince Sianouk having just signed the agreement about the peace in Cambodia and his return uh, to power in this country, came to UNESCO to make one specific request. And he said to the Director General, and I was present, uh, Mr. Director General, it was Mr. Federico Mayor from Spain, Mr. Director General, we just finished a long period of crisis, of war, and terrible suffering. We have so many priorities, but one of my priority is to ask UNESCO to help us inscribe the site of Angkor on the World Heritage List. So I received instruction by my Director General, Mr. Federico Mayor, to work with my colleagues and to prepare the file for the inscription of Angkor. Angkor. Then this, this file was presented to the World Heritage Committee. The World Heritage Committee was meeting in December 1992 in Santa Fe in the US, in the, in the in United, United, United States, States of America. And all members of the, the uh, committee was there. And it was the shift of presidency of the World Heritage Committee from Professor Azedin <laughs> Beshaouch, who was former president of the World Heritage Committee because the meeting took place in 1991 in Tunis, Carthage, yeah. and in 1992 the tradition was the old, old president gave uh, the uh, passation, uh, okay. the handover, passation. Yeah, handover, the handover yeah. to the new president, an American uh, president who was the president, the director general of the National Park Service of the United States. And during the night, uh, the director general called me and said, you know, uh, Mr. Bushnaki, I heard that uh, the evaluation on Angkor is by, by ICOMOS, the International Council of Monuments and Sites, which is the body evaluating the sites to be presented to the World Heritage Committee, is reluctant because they said that uh, this site is not... Uh, uh, managed, this site has no budget, this site has no administration, uh, there is no law. I said, but Mr. Director General, it's normal. This country is coming out from the war. So he said, do your best with Mr. Beshaouch to convince the World Heritage Committee. And with us was an eminent uh, personality, His Excellency uh, Minister Van Nolivan, and with the minister, we tried to discuss with some delegations and finally we find a solution. We consider that the elements presented by ICOMOS was, were true. Yes, there was no legislation. It's normal. In 92, yeah. the country just returned from uh, a from long uh, period yeah, of the, long There was no of management. It's true. There was no administration. It, all this no legislation. So Director General asked me as Director of the Division of Cultural Heritage at UNESCO to work with the Cambodian authorities and in particular with Mr. Van, Moli Van Molivan, His Excellency Van Molivan, to, to reply to these questions 
And this is why, if you know the history <laughs> of the inscription, the site was inscribed on the World Heritage List at, at the same time on the World Heritage List in danger. In danger, yeah. You see? <laughs> yeah. This in danger is a very good uh, support by the international community uh, because everybody recognizes that this site has a very high value, but everybody knows also that it, it needs it is, a yeah. lot of support. Yeah. So this technically is technically and financially. Financially, technically. This is the first stage, 1992. One year later, the government of Japan invited UNESCO and the representative of France to Tokyo in October 1993. And I was, of course, representing UNESCO and Mr. Bechaouche representing the World Heritage Committee. And in, the, in Tokyo, there was a two days discussion about how can we have a program of assistance and cooperation with Cambodia for the site of Angkor. And it is in this meeting that the idea to create an international coordination committee was decided in Tokyo. And on the basis of this decision, they asked UNESCO to be the secretariat of this international coordination committee, represented by, at the beginning, two countries, yeah. Japan and, and France. France, and then many other countries said, but we want to cooperate to and to join. Yeah. This is the beginning of the history of Angkor, which is like an adventure. Because in UNESCO, of course, I continued to be responsible uh, for heritage, we are responsible for culture, and I was following each year the meeting of the World Heritage, the, of the ICC, ICC meeting, in Angkor. Yeah. I was following uh, all the uh, pro progress with my colleagues at UNESCO, with the colleagues here in Siem Reap, to establish uh, an administration, to have a law. For example, for the law of the heritage, we sent from UNESCO uh, an, uh, an Australian lady, Professor uh, Lindel Prott. Professor Lindel Prott was and is a, a very bright international lawyer, and she came here three months to, working yes, with the to, to lawyers the, the to law, establish the heritage, law. the heritage law. We sent also colleagues uh, uh, supported by UNDP to do what we called at that time the ZEMP, Zoning and Management Plan for Angkor. Yes. We organized a training course for the first uh, elements working in the site because for years there was no no real work inside yeah. except yeah. there was an exception yeah. except one team from India from the Archaeological Survey of India S A S I yeah. still working even during the Khmer Rouge period they were still working on the Angkor Wat temple and then they left so the, uh, the French left, uh, the American left. And when, when we started uh, in 1993, uh, it, we, we had, with the support of the Ministry of Culture and the support of the Deputy Prime Minister of the Government of Cambodia, uh, His Excellency uh, Sok An, uh, who unfortunately is not anymore, he was really having from the highest authority and of course at that time first by from his majesty the king uh, Sianuk and then uh, after uh, his death his son who was majesty actual king, king. Uh, Norodom Siamoni was ambassador of Cambodia of the kingdom of Cambodia to UNESCO <laughs> and I was in UNESCO yeah. So it was have, I was having the honor to meet him regularly, to explain to him what we were doing. You know, we, we worked uh, on different issues. The, the problem of water, uh, historically, what is the place of the water in the Khmer civilization? We worked on the value of the monuments of Cambodia and particularly 400 kilometers. This is not a nomination of one site or one temple. It's a nomination of a very large area, 400 square kilometers of temples, uh, barai, uh, streets, 
etc., which were representing uh, what was called the Khmer Empire from the 7th, 8th century after Christ up to the 14th, 15th century. And it was a very important empire. This is the va one value. The value of this site, which was recognized by UNESCO, is the value of what this site gave for humanity. The value is exceptional because they brought a lot of elements of philosophy, of religion, of arts, of, about the sculptures, about the deities. So this element was very important. The second element which was taken into account is that this empire was compared, because we do what we call comparative analysis, was compared to other important empires which existed in the world. And that's why recognizing the site of Angkor is not recognizing only stone, it's recognizing the value of a, a civilization with its inscriptions, these texts, the, the value of the trade which existed because it was not only on Cambodia, actual yeah. territory of Cambodia, it was all Southeast Asia which was under this civilization Khmer. When it comes to the universal value, so what you mentioned earlier, those things are the, I mean, the, the, the value that we cannot count. Exactly. It's very high. You know, you know that how UNESCO came to this situation of recognizing Angkor, recognizing the Taj Mahal in India, recognizing uh, um, the pyramids in Egypt, recognizing the Parthenon in, in Athens, because there was an international campaign in the 60s uh, done in Egypt. In the 60s, the government of Egypt wanted to build a very big dam on the Nile. The construction of this, of, of this dam was ha having the very heavy consequence of rising the level of water and inundating the pharaonic temples. So the Minister of Culture of Egypt came to UNESCO in the 60s yeah. and said, you, UNESCO, can you help us? Because we alone, Egyptians, we cannot uh, save all these temples. And can you make an international appeal? The appeal was done by a very uh, famous uh, director general at that time, uh, René Maheu. He made a very strong appeal saying, the world should help the Egyptian government to, to save the temple. Yeah. This operation brought a lot of countries, Americans, French, British, Italian, Spanish, etc. They, they sent missions and each country have taken one temple, restored, and the best uh, operation and the most spectacular operation at that time, you can see the pictures, uh, they exist now on, on the sites and on books. They, there was one temple which was Abu Simbel, uh, was at the level of the water of the, yeah. lake, of the lake. If the dam comes, it will be 100 meters below water. Okay. So there was a very big operation of dismantling mm -hmm. the temple, cutting, cutting, cutting yeah. all the stones, raising all these stones up on the hill, constructing a very big dome in concrete, yeah. Yeah. and re reconstructing a, a artificial hill. <laughs> Okay. With the temple and exactly as it was at this yeah. level, yeah. it is now 100 uh, bit, meters yeah, yeah, up. A bit higher than before. Yeah. So all this operation brought experts of ECOMOS, International Council of Museums, ECROM, the International Center for Restoration in Rome, uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. In the 60s and in the 70s, they start thinking we should have an international convention, that means an international agreement between countries to save uh, sites and monuments which have an exceptional value. You see why? Yeah, yeah. F from, where, from where comes the exceptional value? Yeah. The exceptional value 
came from this example of monuments, which were, of course, stones of pyramids built in a very, very fine manner. But the, the, the convention, which was adopted in Paris in November 1972, made uh, the statement that there are, in the world, monuments having an exceptional universal value. And that these monuments are not belonging only to the country where they are. Yeah, but belong to the human be, belong humanity. To humanity. This is what we mean by universal exceptional value. But, you know. So uh, some people just say that when they come to Siem Reap and they they visit uh, temple, they some not not all of uh, people. They always say that just a stone. That is why I just want to to, to yes. ask you. And then yeah. many experts say that um, stone of Angkor have their have their soul. You know, they speak. Uh, they speak to people with uh, based on uh, I mean based on uh, picture, based on sculpture on the wall or something. So, so my question to you is that stone a stone or maybe a stone have have uh, soul. Uh, so, yeah. The stone are speaking. You have to understand that for us, in archaeology, when we find a site, this site, when we study it in terms of its construction, in terms of its material, in terms of its decoration, it's speaking, it's explaining how those who came before us, our ancestors, because we consider it's human ancestors, it's Cambodian, but it's also part of our human Uh, memory. Yeah, uh, yeah, memory. Yeah. These sites are not only stones. Stones is means they're only a, a stone, but when you have this stone built in such very fine way, with towers, with the uh, uh, gopura, with st sculptures, this is not something uh, only a stone. It is something living. Yeah. It, it is something that you can see how people were mounting all these monuments, giving them a form, giving them, uh, an, we can interpret what they mean, what they, why they are giving such an importance to the religion that comes from India to Cambodia, which is called Buddhism, which is again a, a, a religion which is having billions of peoples belonging to this religion. So the, regarding looking at this monument, it's not only looking at the stone with the color uh, <laughs> uh, 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 reddish or brown. No, it is speaking to the people. It has a value and it is linked with what we call also at UNESCO, the intangible heritage, something that it's not stone, it's not concrete, it's the value which is behind the stone. So that's why it, it, you have to say in your um, you know, descriptions, in the, the, for the in, tourist operators, yeah. you are not going to see stones. You are going to see living monuments. Because up to now, and we have, uh, of course, very good relations with the monks, with the Buddhist monks, with the, uh, you know, the, these companies which mm. are still worshiping. You can see flowers, uh, offerings, This is a living heritage. It's not only a stone, and then you see, like this, you see stone, and you and you know. I think that we have. When you are mentioning um, a stone a speak, a, sp a stone are speaking, yeah. and then you mention also, um, you mention also a living monument. Absolutely. What what does it mean exactly? It, a living it, uh, monument. A living monument is a monument which has still the value of giving something to the human presence today. We see people worshiping inside the monument. So that means that this monument is not representing only the uh, accumulation of stones. Yeah. It's a, a, an accumulation of stones which have a message, which have something to say. So we archaeologists, we consider that stones are speaking. So they are not only uh, uh, not living place, they are living place. So we consider that the park of Angkor, 
with the villagers which are, who are living in the in the village are in a uh, 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 an area which has hundreds of temples co which are considered by the world as exceptional which are considered by the Cambodians as their heritage and which has the value for their beliefs, for their traditions, for their memories. Absolutely. And some people said that, uh, you know, uh, people around the world, uh, specifically Cambodian people, when they have something, they just, they have something, I mean, but they have bad thing or good thing, they come to temple to Angkor and they bore, uh, they bore ship. And it means that everyone tell everything to Angkor exactly. and then Angkor itself tell its story to the world. Is yes. it correct? That's an this is absolutely correct. And this is something also, what is also exceptional. You don't have in many countries in the world, the national flag with a monument. Cambodia, the national flag of Cambodia is representing Angkor Wat, the three towers of Angkor Wat. This is this is another exceptional value. It, Absol it has a meaning. Absolutely, absolutely. It is. It has a meaning for the nationals. This is our con our country, and it is the representativity of this country is the temples that we have in Angkor. Why the same thing? I mean, I I just raise again and again. Why it is said that everyone tell everything to Angkor and Angkor tell everything, its story to the world. Why? Absolutely. You know, you are today you have millions of visitors. There are visitors coming, having no ID. So we are, of course, working with our colleagues. And this is also part of the ICC meeting to disseminate the information about the civilization of Khmer and to show that this is not a one year or two years, this is centuries of presence, of works, of uh, uh, valorization of the, of the land, of agriculture, of uh, uh, irrigation. This is the whole life. It's, uh, pe these people, they were like us, they were living every day and having to feed the family, uh, to, uh, to, to, to put the rice in the field rice, to verify uh, the water when there is, uh, uh, you know, the, the season of uh, dry season, uh, rainy season, etc. So we have to explain that this is a process, historical process, and it is the testimony of this life during centuries is done by manuscripts, is done by inscriptions. We have a lot of yeah. Khmer inscriptions which are uh, giving a, a narrative, a story. So when you are uh, in front of a temple, you have a narrative, you have a story. Of course, it depends on the uh, training that you have in your country uh, to understand uh, all these aspects. And as I said, ICC is, and uh, in particular, the administration of Apsara, uh, under uh, Her Excellency uh, 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 so, uh, hum, with, with His Excellency Hampi as Director General and the Minister Her, of, Her Excellency uh, von Sak Sakona, we are always discussing how we can show every uh, ICC, a, and you, probably you listened to me yesterday when I spoke about Sambor Prekuk and the importance of new discoveries each time when we come, there are new discoveries explaining how people, Khmer, were living in the 8th century, 9th century. What, who were the kings who were, you know, builders? These kings were builders. When, they were, when there was the first kingdom in Koker or in Sambor Prekuk, uh, and then it comes to uh, Angkor, the kings were builders. They were working with the religious community to leave a temple as the testimony of their beliefs. So when you come from Asia, you can understand better because you have already the Buddhist tradition. So if they come yeah. from India, Japan, Indonesia, etc. When they come from Europe, they need more explanation. And we are suggesting to have in front of each of these very important sites, 
Cocker, Sambor Precook, Prehavir, Encore, Interpretation Centers, where you go and you have explanation. There is one which is very nicely done in Bantesre. In, in okay. Bantesre, when you arrive, if you don't know anything, this interpretation center is giving you uh, the information. information yes. And this information then makes you understand better what you see the zone which are speaking. We are interested in uh, your, your idea and your explanation. And uh, some people say that Uncle Sais uh, is so uh, as a uh, as a school, for example, for, for the world. Is it correct, that Absolutely. idea? We are, you know... You learn a lot from Uncle learn, Sai? First of all, we learn a lot about the builders. Who were the masons? Who have not having theodolite? They don't have drone. <laughs> they don't have... No, it's true. We are, we are learning one thing which is important. These people... They had a, a very long experience of mathematics, of uh, geometry. They were not ignorant, on the contrary. So we learn how, without any technology that we have today, we have, we have yeah. the mobile, we have the, the you know, camera, etc. But it, they, they could build uh, big temples. And they could monument. build big temples standing. Standing so for more than one thousand so years. <laughs> for one than one thousand years. So this is the first lesson that we learn about the technology that was existing, bringing the stone from the Kulen, uh, cutting cut, yeah. cutting the stone, sh choosing the site, uh, organizing the water, uh, water uh, system. flow yeah, water around flow. around the temple. All this is what we call the old technology, which was based on any modern thing. <laughs> but this shows that this is another element of the importance of this society, the Khmer society, which was having a very high level, very high intellectual and scientific level. Otherwise, you cannot build a temple. It will... You mean will, in the old days? In the old days. Imagine we are in the 10th century under the uh, king Jaw Jawarman. The king is having around him people to whom he was giving order, I want to build the temple of Angkor Wat. And they were working, the architects, the geometers, to see the land, to see the quality of the soul. I mean, are, all this is what we learn today when we are working on the restoration of a temple. Then you have the statues. You have artists, now you, you see modern artists are taking lessons uh, from, from, from sculpture. the sculptures and the paintings and the bas-reliefs. The bas-reliefs in, in, uh, in, in Angkor Wat, in Bayonne, they are extraordinary. Everybody is coming. This is a creation by people, again, that didn't have a lot of material that we have today in, at, <laughs> yeah. our, at our disposal. This is, I think, what should be explained in mm. an interpretation center to the visitors who are not familiar with the history of this Khmer period. We are interesting, uh, Professor, and a very simple, to, uh, simple question to you. You have worked uh, with Uncle or for Uncle or for more than uh, 30 years already, and you have learned a lot and a lot, I think. But you think you, I, I mean, you need to learn more about Uncle, or maybe you, you think you can't know all about Uncle because uh, Uncle what is a, has a big history and then history uh, cre uh, will, uh, is created and will be or recreated again yeah. and again. So yeah. you know all or you don't know I, all yet? <laughs> I think that very modestly, I must say that each time I come, each time I learn more. There is no end for the learning. The temple of Taprom that is under the restoration and very uh, fine restoration was posing to us and to our colleagues, um, architects and engineers uh, uh, from Cambodia, from the Apsara, uh, a lot of questions that we have to resolve. So we have to each time learn how to deal with what was done in Taprom. If we go to the Bayon and we work with the Japanese team uh, on, on the Bayon, 
we learn how this temple and all these faces which are extraordinary which are speaking <laughs> people are taking pictures why yeah. because they feel that they are taking something they are smiling i mean they're uh, smiling they're, yeah. and they are giving them something that they will will remain in their memory when they go back to their country they took the picture and say oh, look we have this very beautiful face how this face was done how it was mounted at this height we have so you you always we are ask always we are always coming to uh, issues that we have to discuss but also we are learning each time how the Khmer in the period between the 7th century to the 14th century how they were dealing with managing this huge area and that question uh, is still unknown yet for you yeah, for no, I'm still discovering uh, my my last visit uh, three days ago in Sambor Prikuk showed us Uh, another way of uh, of the of the technology which was used for the bricks and we are having one of the temple that we consider should be considered as a model of br brick construction even for the modern constructors so another question for you uh, professor when you came uh, to uncle and when you saw came paul for the first time what was your feeling your sentiment i i think You, we we feel very small in front of the grandeur of the of these temples, whether we are in front of Angkor Wat, or, or in front of Bayonne, or in front of uh, uh, Bante Sri. I mean, these are uh, extraordinary, extraordinary realization of human, and you feel that you are so small in front of all these temples. This was my first uh, reaction when I came. My goodness, this is so big, you know. When you are at the bottom of the tower yeah. in in Bakeng, and yeah. you see this tower, you know, yeah. like this, and you and and you, you understand there was no scaffolding in... in uh, 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 the scaffolding was in bamboo, probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably, we don't know, because we don't have all... all the, we have to learn every day how this uh, this civilization has given to the man of today a lot of lessons a lot of information and each time you come each time you discover something something else so you come and you learn you come and you learn it mean uh, it is a uh, non-stop learning It's and uh, professor Beshaou, he said that uh, uh, uncle what uh, sai is a place of where you visit and revisit he said that so each time yeah. each, time. each time so and it means each they come to learn discover new each thing each time you di discover new thing as i said in, in sambor prekuk we went probably five or six times before uh, i was present when it was inscribed on the world heritage list and then we went to see the colleagues how they were working and then we discovered this temple uh, in bricks which by chance is absolutely intact absolutely intact so we can see and learn exactly how it was done okay you 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 have been here for almost uh, more than uh, 30, 30 years. years already yeah. and you have visited uh, many time already so my honest question to you very honest, honestly to you you get bored of uh, visiting uh, uncle sai no never Never, because as I said, uh, I am speak when I speak uh, to uh, in other universities, not here but outside. I I always bring the example of Angkor and showing that uh, we because people when you are in Europe sometimes they say they know only ah you go to Angkor Wat and they say no I go to Angkor. Angkor Wat is only one, one element temple. yeah one of <laughs> a, 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 a plurality uh, of temples. And each temple it has its character. They are not similar. <laughs> They are not similar, and that's why, as you you, you 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 are raising this question, are you discovering? Yes, encore for us, and I think I, I can speak on behalf of my colleagues, the experts uh, who are coming regularly for the ICC meeting. We are discovering each time something new. So, according to your observation, it means that. Uh almost uh, 
came Paul have a different uh, architecture, different absolutely. style, different absolutely. character, something yeah. like that. Yeah? yeah, absolutely. The temples have has have been built in different places, in different uh, uh, topography, and that's why they are not. It's not uh, uh, an, an alignment of similar temples. No, each temple. If you go to Rulos, if you go to uh, uh, Bakong, if you go for, to Plum Bakeng, they are all different. They are all different. They are all offering specific questions for the present architects and the present archaeologists. <laughs> Another question, uh, maybe uh, the last uh, question for you. Uh, when you see a uh, temple in ruin, in erosion, uh, maybe you feel sad, you pity them. Uh, basically, yeah. you know, human beings when they see that. But I heard and I listened to experts, they said that uh, ruin, erosion are the beauty. So why, why it contrasts? It's part in our work. Uh, we have to, to explain uh, to those who are listening to us that when Cambodia presented the site, the site has a characteristic of a, a very specific harmony between what was built and what the nature has done. <laughs> it is this harmony that we consider should be also respected. This is the alliance between nature and culture. Nature is what you know, the gods have given in this earth. Yeah. Culture is what man has built during his life and during generation after generation. So it is important in some places to keep the, uh, uh, the testimony as it was touched by the by time. The nature, by, by the time, time yeah. by the time. Yeah. The time is always having an influence in some places, I give you a concrete example. When we were discussing at length with the Indian team working in Tapron, inside the hall, which was called the, the Hall of Dancers, it was completely destroyed. Destroyed and all the stones accumulated uh, yeah, yeah. into the hall. We had a long discussion. What to do? Do we leave this Hall of Dancers and to show to the to, people, to, to the visitors, yeah. this is how it was finally because of time, because of uh, weathering, uh, 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 wind, rain, etc. Yeah. And hundreds of years, this is the result. We find a, a solution. solution. Yeah. We said, to, to explain to the people how was the ceremony done in this hall, we should restore one part of the hall. But in order to show what is the effect of the time and the history, we leave one part destroyed. This is also the value and... Uh, you, you not know, the beauty like I no, mentioned. It's no. No, 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 it's not a question of beauty. <laughs> it's a value of, um, of, under of understanding the, past. the time effect. Mm. And it has a, a, a different beauty it's called in, in the French uh, literature. It is called le romantisme archéologique. You know the uh, uh, archaeological rom uh, uh, romance, romantism, yeah. <laughs> the archaeological romantism. Yeah. It, it exists because it's this association of nature and uh, and monuments. And sometimes, uh, even in Sambor Prekup, which was the last uh, visit we did uh, last week, we were looking at one temple which has a very uh, extraordinary uh, vision. Mm -hmm. the, the trees are totally surrounding it. Yes, yeah, so like at uh, Taprum also. You, so like what, 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 what more is... than Taprum. Oh, really? More than Taprum. If you go uh, to, uh, yeah, I'm going to advise see it, you yeah. to see, okay. it's totally. So we think that we have to do the work of consolidation because we want to to, to restore, to, yeah. to be to be maintained. To yeah, maintained. But at the same time, we feel with our colleague, uh, the director of the site, uh, uh, Fansadi, and with the conservators, we had a long discussion that this is the role of the ICC, yeah. the discussion. And <laughs> you see need to cut trees? Or? Are, yeah. <laughs> and, and we found that one solution should be to leave as much as possible this strong association between, of nature, between nature and, trees and, and, temples. and the temples, so what which has a beauty which is a beauty and people are coming 
if you, you have probably noticed, to Taprom, many also who have the picture so of when, this tree, uh, yep. which yes. is uh, surrounding and you know, uh, enveloping uh, uh, all the monuments. Yes, but uh, sometimes maybe the trees, uh, the trees uh, destroy your uh, temple, we or just, maybe you can say the, the husband and wife, this so, is, you know, they the, live together. This is part of the <laughs> strategic discussion we have for each temple. What should we do? But finally, so I thought that maybe experts always live uh, tree and temple the philosophy, together. The philosophy for Angkor, all area, is to keep the nature as much as possible. This is the philosophy. The, at the same time, because we have monuments which are uh, the testimony of a culture and a civilization, we should do our best to preserve them. To preserve it's temples. A, it is, you know, a compromise ap uh, approach where we are not saying, no, no, we destroy all the trees the, because then we can see the you temple. You keep balance, uh, but uh, at Between. the end, uh, finally, you still uh, want to keep temple more Ab than trees. <laughs> Absolutely. No, we keep, because, it, because this is the testimony. The trees, you can have them anyway. But if, you, if, if they are damaging the temple, then we have to take a decision. But mostly, we are trying to find a, a compromise solution in bringing as much as possible the natural setting in addition to the human setting. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bosnaki, for your information, for your knowledge you share to uh, the public, especially Cambodian public. It's my pleasure and I repeat, it's my honor to be with uh, my colleagues uh, from Cambodia since 1992 without uh, any interruption up to now <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much once again thank you and i wish you good luck and good uh, good in everything okay. Akun. <laughs> Akun. <laughs> thank you thank you